Part Two of Enchantress of Venus by Lee Douglas Brackett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Two. A curious silence fell on the square. A nervous sibilance ran round and round under the silence, and men came slowly out from the verandas and the doors of the wine shops. Suddenly. A woman with disheveled hair pointed her arm at Stark and laughed, the shrieking laugh of a harpy. Stark found his way barred by three tall young men with hard mouths and crafty eyes, who smiled at him as hounds smile before the kill. "'Stranger,' they said. "'Earthman!" "'Outlaw,' answered Stark, and it was only half a lie. One of the young men took a step forward. Did you fly like a dragon over the mountains of White Cloud? Did you drop from the sky? I came on Malthor's ship. A kind of sigh went round the square, and with it the name of Malthor. The eager faces of the young men grew heavy with disappointment, but the leader said sharply, I was on the quay when Malthor docked. You were not on board. It was Stark's turn to smile. In the light of the torches his eyes blazed cold and bright as ice against the sun. "'Ask Malthor the reason for that,' he said. "'Ask the man with the torn cheek. Or perhaps,' he added softly, "'you would like to learn for yourselves.' The young men looked at him, scowling, in an odd mood of indecision. Stark settled himself, every muscle loose and ready and the woman who had laughed crept closer and peered at Stark through her tangled hair, breathing heavily of the poppy wine. All at once she said loudly, "'He came out of the sea. That's where he came from. He's—' One of the young men struck her across the mouth, and she fell down in the mud. A burly seaman ran out and caught her by the hair, dragging her to her feet again. His face was frightened and very angry. He hauled the woman away, cursing her for a fool and beating her as he went. She spat out blood and said no more. "'Well,' said Stark to the young men, "'have you made up your minds?' "'Minds!' said a voice behind them, a harsh-timbered, rasping voice that handled the liquid vocables of the Venusian speech very clumsily indeed. They have no minds, these whelps. If they had, they'd be off about their business, instead of standing here badgering a stranger." The young men turned, and now, between them, Stark could see the man who had spoken. He stood on the steps of the tavern. He was an earthman, and at first Stark thought he was old, because his hair was white and his face deeply lined. His body was wasted with fever the muscles all gone to knotty strings twisted over bone. He leaned heavily on a stick, and one leg was crooked and terribly scarred. He grinned at Stark and said in colloquial English, "'Watch me get rid of him.' He began to tongue-lash the young men, telling them that they were idiots, the misbegotten offspring of swamp toads, utterly without manners and that if they did not believe the stranger's story they should go and ask Malthor, as he suggested. Finally he shook his stick at them, fairly screeching, "'Go on now, go away, leave us alone, my brother of earth and I.' The young men gave one hesitant glance at Stark's feral eyes. Then they looked at each other and shrugged, and went away across the square half-sheepishly, like great loutish boys caught in some misdemeanor. The white-haired earthman beckoned to Stark, and as Stark came up to him on the steps, he said under his breath almost angrily, "'You're in a trap.' Stark glanced back over his shoulder. At the edge of the square the three young men had met a fourth, who had his face bound up in a rag. They vanished almost at once into a side street, but not before Stark had recognized the fourth man as Malthor. It was the captain he had branded. With loud cheerfulness the lame man said in Venusian, "'Come in and drink with me, brother, and we will talk of earth.' 
The tavern was one of the standard low-class Venusian pattern, a single huge room under bare thatch, the wall half open with the reed shutters rolled up, the floor of split logs propped up on pilings out of the mud. A long low bar, little tables, mangy skins and heaps of dubious cushions on the floor around them, and at one end the entertainers, two old men with a drum and a reed pipe, and a couple of sulky, tired-looking girls. The lame man led Stork to a table in the corner and sank down, calling for wine. His eyes, which were dark and haunted by long pain, burned with excitement. His hands shook. Before Stark had sat down, he had begun to talk, his words stumbling over themselves as though he could not get them out fast enough. How is it there now? Has it changed any? Tell me how it is. The cities, the lights, the paved streets, the women, the sun. Oh, Lord, what I wouldn't give to see the sun again. And women with dark hair and their clothes on. He leaned forward, staring hungrily into Stark's face, as though he could see those things mirrored there. For God's sake, talk to me. Talk to me in English and tell me about Earth. How long have you been here? asked Stark. I don't know. How do you reckon time in a world without a sun, without one damned little star to look at? Ten years? A hundred years? How should I know? Forever. Tell me about Earth." Stark smiled wryly. I haven't been there for a long time. The police were too ready with a welcoming committee. But the last time I saw it, it was just the same. The lame man shivered. He was not looking at Stark now, but at some place far beyond him. "'Autumn woods,' he said, "'red and gold on the brown hills. Snow! I can remember how it felt to be cold. The air bit you when you breathed it, and the women wore high-heeled slippers. No big bare feet tromping in the mud, but little sharp heels tapping on clean pavement.' Suddenly he glared at Stark, his eyes furious and bright with tears. Why the hell did you have to come here and start me remembering? I'm Larrabee. I live in Sharoon. I've been here forever, and I'll be here till I die. There isn't any earth. It's gone. Just look up into the sky and you'll know it's gone. There's nothing anywhere but clouds and Venus and mud. He sat still, shaking, turning his head from side to side. A man came with wine, put it down, and went away again. The tavern was very quiet. There was a wide space empty around the two earthmen. Beyond that, people lay on the cushions, sipping the poppy wine and watching with a sort of furtive expectancy. Abruptly, Larrabee laughed, a harsh sound that held a certain honest mirth. I don't know why I should get sentimental about Earth at this late date. Never thought much about it when I was there. Nevertheless, he kept his gaze averted, and when he picked up his cup, his hand trembled so that he spilled some of the wine. Stark was staring at him in unbelief. Larrabee, he said. You're Mike Larrabee. You're the man who got half a million credits out of the strong room of the Royal Venus." Larrabee nodded. "'And got away with it, right over the mountains of White Cloud, that they said couldn't be flown. And do you know where that half a million is now? At the bottom of the Red Sea, along with my ship and my crew, out there in the Gulf. Lord knows why I lived.' He shrugged. Well, anyway, I was heading for Sharoon when I crashed and I got here, so why complain? He drank again, deeply, and Stark shook his head. You've been here nine years, then, by Earth time, he said. He had never met Larrabee, but he remembered the pictures of him that had flashed across the space on police bands. Larrabee had been a young man then, dark and proud and handsome. Larrabee guessed his thought. I've changed, haven't I? Stark said lamely. Everybody thought you were dead. Larrabee laughed. 
After that, for a moment, there was silence. Stark's ears were straining for any sound outside. There was none. He said abruptly, "'What about this trap I'm in?' "'I'll tell you one thing about it,' said Larrabee. "'There's no way out. I can't help you. I wouldn't if I could get that straight. But I can't anyway.' "'Thanks,' Stark said sourly. "'You can at least tell me what goes on.' "'Listen,' said Larrabee. I'm a cripple and an old man, and Sharoon isn't the sweetest place in the solar system to live. But I do live. I have a wife, a slatternly wench, I'll admit, but good enough in her way. You'll notice some little dark-haired brats rolling in the mud. They're mine, too. I have some skill at setting bones and such, and so I can get drunk for nothing as often as I will, which is often. Also, because of this bum leg, I'm perfectly safe. So don't ask me what goes on. I take great pains not to know. Stark said, Who are the Elhari? <laughs> Would you like to meet them? Larrabee seemed to find something very amusing in that thought. Just go on up to the castle. They live there. They're the lords of Sharoon, and they're always glad to meet strangers. He leaned forward suddenly. Who are you, anyway? What's your name? And why the devil did you come here? My name is Stark, and I came here for the same reason you did. Stark, repeated Larrabee slowly, his eyes intent. That rings a faint bell. Seems to me I saw a wanted flash once. Some idiot that had led a native revolt somewhere in the Jovian colonies. A big, cold-eyed brute they referred to colorfully as the wild man from Mercury. He nodded, pleased with himself. Wild man, eh? Well, Sharoon will tame you down. Perhaps, said Stark. His eyes shifted constantly, watching Larrabee, watching the doorway and the dark veranda and the people who drank but did not talk among themselves. Speaking of strangers, one came here at the time of the last rains. He was Venusian, from up coast. A big young man. I used to know him. Perhaps he could help me. Larrabee snorted. By now he had drunk his own wine, and Stark's too. Nobody can help you. As for your friend, I never saw him. I'm beginning to think I should never have seen you. Quite suddenly he caught up his stick and got with some difficulty to his feet. He did not look at Stark, but said harshly, "'You'd better get out of here.' Then he turned and limped unsteadily to the bar. Stark rose. He glanced after Larrabee, and again his nostrils twitched to the smell of fear. Then he went out of the tavern the way he had come in, through the front door. No one moved to stop him. Outside the square was empty. It had begun to rain. Stark stood for a moment on the steps. He was angry and filled with a dangerous unease, the hair-trigger nervousness of a tiger that senses the beaters creeping toward him up the wind. He would almost have welcomed the sight of Malthor and the three young men, but there was nothing to fight but the silence and the rain. He stepped out into the mud, wet and warm around his ankles. An idea came to him, and he smiled, beginning now to move with a definite purpose along the side of the square. The sharp downpour strengthened. Rain smoked from Stark's naked shoulders, beat against thatch and mud with a hissing rattle. The harbor had disappeared behind boiling clouds of fog, where water struck the surface of the Red Sea and was turned again instantly by chemical action into vapor. The quays and the neighboring streets were being swallowed up in the impenetrable mist. Lightning came with an eerie bluish flare, and thunder came rolling after it. Stark turned up the narrow way that led toward the castle. Its lights were winking out now, one by one, blotted by the creeping fog. Lightning etched its shadowy bulk against the night, 
and then was gone. And through the noise of the thunder that followed, Stark thought he heard a voice calling. He stopped, half-crouching, his hand on his gun. The cry came again. A girl's voice, thin as the wail of a seabird through the driving rain. Then he saw her, a small white blur in the street behind him, running, and even in that dim glimpse of her every line of her body was instinct with fright. Stark set his back against a wall and waited. There did not seem to be anyone with her, though it was hard to tell in the darkness and the storm. She came up to him and stopped just out of his reach, looking at him and away again with a painful irresoluteness. A bright flash showed her to him clearly. She was young, not long out of her childhood, and pretty in a stupid sort of way. Just now her mouth trembled on the edge of weeping, and her eyes were very large and scared. Her skirt clung to her long thighs, and above it her naked body, hardly fleshed into womanhood, glistened like snow in the wet. Her pale hair hung dripping over her shoulders. Stark said gently, "'What do you want with me?' She looked at him so miserably like a wet puppy that he smiled, and as though that smile had taken what little resolution she had out of her, she dropped to her knees, sobbing. "'I can't do it!' she wailed. He, "'He'll kill me, but I just can't do it!' "'Do what?' asked Stark. She stared up at him. "'Run away!' she urged him. "'Run away now! You'll die in the swamps, but that's better than being one of the lost ones.' She shook her thin arms at him. "'Run away!' The street was empty. Nothing showed, nothing stirred anywhere. Stark leaned over and pulled the girl to her feet, drawing her in under the shelter of the thatched eaves. "'Now, then,' he said, "'suppose you stop crying and tell me what this is all about.' Presently, between gulps and hiccups, he got the story out of her. "'I am Zareth,' she said, "'Malthor's daughter. He's afraid of you because of what you did to him on the ship, so he ordered me to watch for you in the square when you would come out of the tavern. Then I was to follow you and—' She broke off, and Stark patted her shoulder. "'Go on.' But a new thought had occurred to her. "'If I do, will you promise not to beat me, or—' She looked at his gun and shivered. "'I promise.' She studied his face what she could see of it in the darkness, and then seemed to lose some of her fear. I was to stop you. I was to say what I've already said about being Malthor's daughter and the rest of it, and then I was to say that he wanted me to lead you into an ambush while pretending to help you escape, but that I couldn't do it, and would help you to escape anyhow, because I hated Malthor and the whole business about the Lost Ones, so you would believe me and follow me, and I would lead you into the ambush. She shook her head and began to cry again, quietly this time, and there was nothing of the woman about her at all now. She was just a child, very miserable and afraid. Stark was glad he had branded Malthor. But I can't lead you into the ambush. I do hate Malthor, even if he is my father, because he beats me. And the lost ones, she paused. Sometimes I hear them at night, chanting way out there beyond the mist. Oh, it is a very terrible sound. It is, said Stark. I've heard it. Who are the lost ones, Zareth? I can't tell you that, said Zareth. It's forbidden even to speak of them. And anyway, she finished honestly, I don't even know. People disappear, that's all. Not our own people of Sharoon, at least not very often, but strangers like you. And I'm sure my father goes off into the swamps to hunt among the tribes there, 
and I'm sure he comes back from some of his voyages with nothing in his hold but men from some captured ship. Why or what for? I don't know, except I've heard the chanting. They live out there in the Gulf, do they, the Lost Ones? They must. There are many islands there. And what are the El Hari, the lords of Sharun? Don't they know what's going on, or are they part of it? She shuddered and said, It is not for us to question the El Hari, nor even wonder what they do. Those who have gone from Sharun, nobody knows where. Stark nodded. He was silent for a moment, thinking. Then Sarath's little hand touched his shoulder. Go, she said. Lose yourself in the swamps. You're strong, and there's something about you different from other men. You may live to find your way through. No, I have something to do before I leave Sharun. He took Sarath's damp, fair head between his hands and kissed her on the forehead. You're a sweet child, Zareth, and a brave one. Tell Malthor that you did exactly as he told you, and it was not your fault I wouldn't follow you. He will beat me anyway, said Zareth philosophically, but perhaps not quite so hard. He'll have no reason to beat you at all if you tell him the truth, that I would not go with you because my mind was set on going to the castle of the El Hari. There was a long, long silence, while Zareth's eyes widened slowly in horror, and the rain beat on the thatch, and fog and thunder rolled together across Sharun. "'To the castle?' she whispered. "'Oh, no! Go into the swamps, or let Malthor take you, but don't go to the castle!' She took hold of his arm her fingers biting into his flesh with the urgency of her plea. "'You're a stranger. You don't know. Please, don't go up there.' "'Why not?' asked Stark. "'Are the El Hari demons? Do they devour men?' He loosened her hands gently. "'You'd better go now. Tell your father where I am, if he wishes to come after me.' Zareth backed away slowly out into the rain, staring at him as though she looked at someone standing on the brink of hell, not dead, but worse than dead. Wonder showed in her face, and through it a great yearning pity. She tried once to speak, and then shook her head, and turned away, breaking into a run as though she could not endure to look upon Stark any longer. In a second she was gone. Stark looked after her for a moment, strangely touched. Then he stepped out into the rain again, heading upward along the steep path that led to the castle of the lords of Sharun. The mist was blinding. Stark had to feel his way, and as he climbed higher, above the level of the town, he was lost in the sullen redness. A hot wind blew and each flare of lightning turned the crimson fog to a hellish purple. The night was full of a vast hissing where the rain poured into the gulf. He stopped once to hide his gun in a cleft between the rocks. At length he stumbled against a carven pillar of black stone, and found the gate that hung from it, a massive thing sheathed in metal. It was barred and the pounding of his fists upon it made little sound. Then he saw the gong, a huge disk of beaten gold beside the gate. Stark picked up the hammer that lay there, and set the deep voice of the gong rolling out between the thunderbolts. A barred slit opened, and a man's eyes looked out at him. Stark dropped the hammer. "'Open up!' he shouted. "'I would speak with the El Hari.' From within he heard an echo of laughter. Scraps of voices came to him on the wind, and then more laughter, and then, slowly, the great valves of the gate creaked open, wide enough only to admit him. He stepped through, and the gateway was shut behind him with a ringing clash. He stood in a huge open court. Enclosed within its walls was a village of thatched huts with open sheds for cooking, 
and behind them were pens for the stabling of beasts, the wingless dragons of the swamps that can be caught and broken to the goad. He saw this only in vague glimpses because of the fog. The men who had let him in clustered around him, thrusting him forward into the light that streamed from the huts. "'He would speak with the El Hari, one of them shouted, to the women and children who stood in the doorways watching. The words were picked up and tossed around the court, and a great burst of laughter went up. Stark eyed them, saying nothing. They were a puzzling breed. The men obviously were soldiers and guards to the El Hari, for they wore the harness of fighting men. As obviously these were their wives and children, all living behind the castle walls and having little to do with Sharun. But it was their racial characteristic that surprised him. They had interbred with the pale tribes of the swamp edges that had peopled Sharun, and there were many with milk-white hair and broad faces. Yet even these bore an alien stamp. Stark was puzzled, for the race he would have named was unknown here behind the mountains of White Cloud, and almost unknown anywhere on Venus at sea level, among the sweltering marshes and the eternal fogs. End of Part Two